Welcome, and uh, thanks for joining me. A few months ago, I did an independent study on uh, John Calvin and his institutes, um, and today I thought it would just be fun to casually talk about um, some of my first impressions in reading Calvin. Um, this was the first time I've read Calvin seriously. I've read a bit from him before, um, but was this was the first deep dive into his life and his work. Um, of course, like most Christians, I grew up with a concept of Calvinism, um, but as Charles Party um, says in his book that I'll, I'll, I read and I talk about, um, there are few terms uh, less clearly defined than Calvinism and Platonism is his other example. Um, as terms that get thrown around uh, without people necessarily reading the original text that they're based on. And so that's something I always want to avoid with my own work and my own scholarship is I don't want to be somebody that talks about a theologian without saying that I've actually read them. Um, and so I wanted to do a deep dive in Calvin. Um, he's been extremely influential on Bart, on many other theologians, of course. Um, I find him extremely interesting and fascinating. And so I wanted to do this reading. Um, and so, yeah, just want to casually talk about my impressions with Calvin. And, and then part of this video, too, is a... Um, kind of a book recommendation. If you also want to do some readings in Calvin, um, I think the books that I read for this were extremely helpful for me, and hopefully you'll find it as well. So I'll just talk about each book I read um, and why I read it, share something I learned about it, maybe a few quotes along the way. Um, the main goal of this independent study was to look at the institutes, and so I didn't really have a ton of time to look at the commentaries. Um, I did dive in some to uh, Calvin's commentaries. I occasionally dip into his commentaries, um, and I actually benefit from it. I have his New Testament um, commentaries um, in the newer translation that uh, the Torrance brothers, um, David and uh, Thomas Torrance, were the, were the editors of that version. Um, and so that's a very interesting translation project. Um, there's the standard one that's free online that I use for Old Testament texts. Um, but I didn't have a time to necessarily focus on any of those commentaries. I'm mostly focused on the Institutes, um, which of course for Calvin, the Institutes is kind of the shortened version, believe it or not, of the commentaries. Really, commentaries are the fullest expression of Calvin's thought. Um, at least that's how I've come to understand it. Um, but I did want to go through the Institutes itself as a uh, proper um, d uh, dogmatic work in theology, such an influential one. And so I read them quite thoroughly and just want to make a few comments, even though, you know, I do want to clarify I'm not an expert in Calvin. I'm not somebody that claims to be an expert in Calvin. Um, I've only recently begun reading them. So these are just some reflections that I hope you find helpful. Um, I always try to have a charitable hermeneutic whenever I read somebody new. And so when I approached Calvin, I knew there were some things I was hesitant about his theology. Um, people that are familiar with me on this channel will know that I'm a critic of penal substitution, for example. And, um, you know, Calvin was one of the first people to initiate really arguably the first person to come up with a systematic uh, presentation of penal substitution. But in spite of all that, I laid aside any criticisms I've had and um, tried to approach Calvin as charitably as I could. And so hopefully um, that shows in this video where I just am talking about what I liked from Calvin. Um, and so I, I genuinely did find a lot of things I liked about him. Um, but um, yeah, with all that said, I'll go through the list of what I read and then just kind of talk through what I enjoyed. So um, the order of how I read Calvin. So I read the Institutes actually twice in this independent study. The first time I read it was in the shortened version of the Institutes, which is the French edition of uh, 1541. Um, it's what's been called Calvin's essential edition. So it's it's slimmer uh, by quite a bit. It's about half the size of the, uh, the final Latin edition of um, the Institutes, and that's because the French edition was for a more public audience. Latin, obviously, was the academic language um, at the time. And so um, this is a translation that was done by Robert White um, a few years ago. It's I, I guess it's been since 2014 when this came out. Um, but um, somebody recommended this one to me, and I enjoyed reading this first because it kind of gave a quicker overview of the Institutes before actually getting into the full work. And then, of course, I read the standard translation of the Institutes, which is in the Library of Christian Classics. Um, the Battles translation is what it's called. Um, let me see if I can find that exactly. 
yeah, the Ford Lewis Battles translation is what that's called. And um, it's ed edited by John McNeil. There's some really helpful footnotes in here. And so this is the two volume classic from the Latin uh, text. And so I read both of those first. Um, I then dived into Calvin's, um, excuse me, I then dived into uh, this biography of Calvin, which I found very helpful. A friend recommended this to me. Um, he said, his supervisor recommended it to him. Um, and so um, it, it was a really humanizing book. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, but it's, it, it was a good book on Calvin. It's a newer biography um, from what I understand, relatively new biography, um, I guess 2009. So not quite that new, but I found this really helpful for an overview of Calvin's life and really it, it look into Calvin as a person. Um, and then really the main secondary work I looked through was the theology of John Calvin by Charles Party. Party's a definitely a Calvin scholar. He's, he's well known, um, as being a careful reader of, uh, Calvin. This was a text that my professor recommended. Um, I really enjoyed this book a lot. I think this is probably the one stop book I would recommend, um, even though I've not read any others, but I, I felt like this was a very good book to start with um, for just an overview of the Institutes, an overview of Calvin's theology, a very um, careful reading by somebody who's been working with Calvin for a very long time. And so this is the culmination of Party's um, really lifelong long, uh, mission of reading Calvin. And then the final book I read was kind of a um, very interesting one for me. Roland Boyer is a scholar that I really enjoy uh, for a lot of reasons. He's he's done a lot of political theology. He's done a lot of Marxism, a lot of um, historical Christian theology. Um, but this is his wrestling with Calvin's politics. And I'll talk about um, kind of his arguments and stuff, but I really enjoyed this book as well. And so those are the books I'm going to talk about. Um, and kind of what I enjoyed from each of those. What I want to do first is to begin with the secondary text before I actually get to the Institutes, even though I read it the other way around. And so let's go back to the biography. Um, this biography of Calvin, like I said, was very humanizing of Calvin. I think Calvin gets kind of this bad reputation as being this cold figure who was kind of a um, killjoy, but this really humanized him. And, it, you know, some of the stories about him losing his firstborn um, and the effect that had on him was such a quite a moving uh, account to read. And so I very much enjoyed how uh, this author, um, Souter House, Souter, Souter House, I don't know how to say it. I think it's Dutch. Uh, he is a, uh, yeah, he's a Dutch theologian. Um, really did a great job of making a readable book, a book that really emphasized, as the subtitle says, uh, Calvin as a pilgrim. I thought that was a very good way of putting it and kind of shows Calvin's own, um, kind of, um, not only just his, uh, pitfalls as a human being, but his just vulnerability as a human being. And, and he isn't this tyrannical figure and, um, the author did ex an especially good job with the uh, Michael Servetus account and, and that whole issue of uh, a heretic burned at the stake um, and Calvin's role in that um, event. And so I, I thought that was helpful for that. That's been one of the historical things that's typically lodged at Calvin as a critique against him that he, you know, was this tyrannical master over Geneva and therefore he, he directly killed <laughs> Uh, this this heretical figure, and I, I don't think that's an accurate um, understanding of that event. And so um, a better understanding is maybe found in this book. And so like I said, it's uh, humanizing for uh, Calvin, I think, and I just thought it was a very good overview of Calvin's life. Um, definitely recommend this. I think theologically it does have some good stuff where it, it also dives into a little bit of Bart, um, Calvin's theology. And so, yeah, I definitely enjoyed that one. Um, I think as an intro, it was very good. Um, really, this was a the highlight of my readings. I, I really enjoyed this. I mean, the Boyer text of the other two secondary books that weren't biographies, um, this one, I think, was the most helpful for an overview of um, Calvin. This is uh, more specific to Calvin's politics, which I'll get to, but very much enjoyed this. And so Party's kind of central claim and argument here is that um, union with Christ is um, a central 
facet of Calvin's theology. He doesn't say that it is the the central facet of Calvin's theology. He's too multifaceted for that. Um, and so I'll just read this quote that I found important. Um, I'll just skip around. This is on page 27. Um, he says, Calvin is a systematic thinker, but not a system builder. His faith is based on the recognition that Jesus is Lord and we are united with him. Calvin's theology is grounded on Christian convictions, not philosophical or theological principles. His exposition is more confessional than argumentative. And while his use of reason is constant, his confidence in reason is not unwavering. I'll skip down a bit. Um, Calvin's theology is written for the faithful, not the logical. Calvin's theology is not designed to exercise the mental muscles of academically trained professionals, but to edify the Christian heart in the community of the faithful. To put the point briefly and sharply, Calvin is not a Calvinist because union with Christ is at the heart of his theology and not theirs. Um, and so this comes at the end of a section where um, Party does a very interesting, very good job at locating himself as a scholar amongst, you know, the misrepresentations of Calvin, the uh, maybe overly conservative um, readings of Calvin and, and whatnot. And so that argument I, th I thought was convincing. I thought it was um, very um, well presented by Party. He, he does a lot in the book, so it's not just about that argument. There's a lot more of where he's trying to do a general overview. I think Party's framework framing of the doctrine of election especially was helpful i thought that he um kind of put it in a way where party accepted that there is problems with it um both morally ethically theologically but also really tried to stress that we have to understand calvin charitably on his own terms of what his goal was and so election as we'll get into with um with the institutes election for calvin is placed within uh the context of the christian life in prayer and so it's not the speculative doctrine and i think that's the other thing party mentions a lot that i i also picked up on in my reading from the institutes is calvin was very much anti-speculation and so that's something that's often missed with a lot of the discussion of his thought and so I enjoyed that with Party. Um, his book was very good. Uh, the final book, this was um, Political Grace is the title of Roland Boyer. This was kind of more because I was interested in really Calvin's politics as kind of um, the influence of those politics. And then really Boyer is just somebody I really like. And so putting the two together, I read this book and I really, really enjoyed it. I think Boyer is just such a fun scholar he's not dry he's very interesting to read i think the way that he was able to mix um academic writing with his own kind of biography was very important powerful for this book um the main argument of the book i'll just summarize it he he cites it right on the back um the argument of this book may be summed up in one sentence john calvin let the radical political cat peek out of the theological bag only to try his hardest to push it back in and tie the bag up again. And so what Boyer is looking at is the way that Calvin recognizes the radical freedom of the Christian, for, for one example. But then on the other hand, he tries to push that back down and limit that freedom within the political realm, because Calvin's constantly working in this kind of duality between he's a very good student of the Bible, um, and so he's recognizing actually some of the duality that's in Scripture itself between do you unbay do you obey unjust rulers or is there room and permission to rebel against unjust rulers? And so, like um, Calvin's commentary on Daniel endorses. Um, revolt against unjust rulers. But Calvin's commentary on Romans 13 does the opposite and follows Paul in saying that we cannot um, resist unjust rulers. And so that duality is located not only in those sort of political texts, but also theologically, uh, Cal uh, Boyer argues, in Calvin's actual thought. And so there's a few points I mentions um, that I saved here to bring up. So Boyer mentions notes how Calvin's high view of scripture has revolutionary potential, um, that Calvin's too good of a reader of the scripture to not acknowledge that. Um, Calvin 
this is then on chapter three, Calvin glimpses the radical possibilities of grace, but then moves to um, contain those possibilities. That's an argument that Boyer makes as well that I found really interesting and compelling, um, where, for example, the freedom of a Christian is, is emphasized in, in Calvin, but then he also is, on the other hand, is working to, um, you know, pl- put that in, within the context of, but you also have to obey um, unjust rulers. And so what, what Boyer is actually doing historically, too, that's interesting is he's locating Calvin um, within a situation where um, a lot of the Protestant church is trying to deal with the events of Munich and the uh, the peasants revolt that Thomas Munzer um, led. And so Calvin's trying to distance himself from that type of a Protestantism that fully endorses revolt and tries to um, kind of develop a theocratic state um, by violent overthrow of oppressors. And so Calvin's actively working to overcome the impression that Protestantism is that or that it leads to that, um, which led to a lot of the um, the the ruling class at the time to kind of suppress it. But, but Calvin is working, I mean, in the beginning of the Institutes is directly a letter to um, one of the leaders at the time. And so I found that book very interesting. So if you're interested in Calvin's politics, I think this is a great place to go. Um, He very much does a careful um, analysis of the back and forth that Calvin has within his thought about politics, particularly around that question of is the Christian gospel revolutionary just in a spiritual sense, but is it also revolutionary in a political and a ethical and social sense? Or is the Christian gospel more conservative in that you have to obey the rulers? And so Calvin kind of does this back and forth that I think is very, very interesting. And and Boyer does a good job of bringing that out. And so I enjoyed that a lot. Um, And now to the Institutes. Um, Obviously, the Institutes are massive. I'm not going to cover everything that I enjoyed from this. Um, the shorter version had similar things as the longer one, so I'll try not to repeat um, too much. But what was interesting is how the uh, shorter, the French version follows a different structure um, than the um, the two than the longer version. So the the long version has four books to it. This just had. It was all in one. Um, And so that kind of leads to some of this. And so Calvin um, follows a lot of the same arguments. Um, One of the notable changes that I picked up on is the Institute's proper, the Latin version, the longer version, ends with Calvin's kind of explosive chapter on civil government, which is really one of the key chapters that Boyer's pulling from for um, his, his reading of Calvin's politics. This chapter ends with, or this vol- version ends with the Christian life, uh, which is sometimes called the golden booklet, this, this section of the Christian life. Um, and so it, it's a civil government, government, but then it does Christian life. And so I found that really interesting. Um, it also follows some of the cataclysm catechisms of the time. Um, he, kind of works through the Lord's Prayer. He works through the Ten Commandments, stuff like that that you would expect in a catechism. But a lot of the stuff is similar. Like the first three, four chapters or so are basically um, just shortened versions of what is in the Institutes. So I enjoyed this a lot. Um, I should note that Christian life uh, chapter, um, my professor um, is convinced that that's the core of Calvin's theology. So take that as you will, this this chapter that is called the Golden Booklet. Um, it's Calvin's um, exposition of what the Christian life entails. And so I had some problems with that chapter that I, I, but I do see her argument that it's the center of the Institutes because a lot of the um, kind of pastoral implications of the Institutes were brought out there. Um, C. Baxter Kruger once talked about how the um, Institutes, he, he reads it somewhat devotionally. And I think the quote I read from Party kind of reflects that too, that um, the Institutes isn't designed to be, you know, necessarily an argument. It has arguments in it. Um, Calvin's a good humanist. He's a good lawyer. He's, he's arguing in a good way. Um, he's using a lot of rhetoric, of course, too. But um, but where both, you know, party is making this case that um, it's not primarily for that. That's obviously included, but it's not primarily for convincing. It's It has a devotional characteristic almost. And so I, I found that really compelling. Um, 
in this text, one of the quotes um, that I quite enjoyed that reminds me a lot of Schleiermacher's Eternal Covenant. Um, I don't think I've done a video on the Eternal Covenant before, but I've talked about it in some of my books where um, Cal uh, Schleiermacher has this concept of the Eternal Covenant between faith and science, where faith has no reason to contradict science and science has no reason to exclude faith. And so it, it was interesting to find, obviously, Calvin's in a pre-critical um, situation. He's before the Enlightenment. He's before some of the big critiques against Christianity, such as historical criticism, um, evolution, all of that. And, but at the same time, he's able to appreciate and recognize uh, the value of science as a gift from God. And so this is on page 55 of this volume that if we recognize the spirit of God as the unique source of truth, we will not despise truth wherever it appears unless we wish to offend God's spirit. The truth is we should judge nothing to be exceptional or worthy of praise unless we recognize that it comes from God. And so... I'll jump and read one more on the next page. Um, so he, where he's, he does endorse uh, secular um, um, philosophies and truths, where now if the Lord cho chose to allow sinful, unbelieving men to teach us natural philosophy, dialectic, and other disciplines, we ought to make use of them, lest we be punished for our neglect in despising God's gift wherever they are offered to us. And so I like that because it... it I think a lot of the more traditional interpreters of Calvin, a lot of the more traditional um, readings of Calvin place him kind of at odds with natural sciences and, and especially, you know, along the questions of like evolution or questions of social biography or biology or things like that. But Calvin seems to have this, this space in his thought where he accepts the conclusions or at least accepts uh, the truths of science as um, God given. And that in despising those and despising critical research in, in, into the, you know, scripture, for example, or any of that, um, we're despising uh, God's uh, gift. I thought that was interesting. Obviously, Calvin meant that in a different way than I, I think we would interpret that today. But nonetheless, I think it's still a uh, interesting quote. Another one was in Calvin's exposition of the Tenth Commandment. Um, he makes this case that I, I made a note in the margin where I think this is kind of a um, critique of libertarian ideology, if anybody's familiar with that, um, where he says that whatever we may conceive, plan, wish, or pursue is inseparable from our neighbor's welfare and interests. And so for me, I think that makes a clear distinction between a Christian uh, political and moral ethic and a libertarian ethic, which is a little bit more, um, well, libertarian. It, it's, it's very much um, a free-for-all where I do what's best for me, not what's best for my neighbor. And Calvin returns to that um, later in the Christian life, where he says, uh, this is on page 796, everyone should recognize that whatever he has and is capable of doing is owed to his neighbor. There is no limit to his obligation to do good except his lack of capacity. However far his, capa however far his capacity may extend, it should always answer to the rule of love. And so I really like that quote a lot. I think that connects really interestingly with uh, my book on the early church fathers and how there was this strong emphasis on the obligation to help the needy, that it wasn't some optional thing that you do out of the kindness of your own heart, but it was actually an obligation um, for the Christian. And so to see that repeated in Calvin, I, th I thought was very interesting, particularly around how there's kind of this reformed libertarian movement that I, I think I'm critical of. And, and it seems interesting that there's room to see a critique of that in Calvin, even though, of course, the libertarian ide ideology is a little bit of a newer phenomenon. Um, and so moving to the Latin edition of the Institutes, I have a little bit more notes to go through um, that I found stuff that I found really helpful. I would say overall that Calvin is a rewarding figure to read, even if you disagree with him. He's very, he's a very engaging and rewarding figure. And so I, I very much enjoyed going through the institutes in this way. Um, and especially this Latin version, which was a lot more thorough, 
Um, and I, I enjoyed it a lot. And so it's definitely a rewarding experience. Um, so even things that maybe I would criticize Calvin about, I kind of came to appreciate him much, much more fully than I maybe would have before, um, when I was mostly just operating with assumptions about his theology. And so I enjoyed that a lot. Um, one of the themes that I kept picking up on and that I wrote about in my final paper for this independent study is how... Calvin is consistently anti-speculative. Um, I I found that really compelling, especially in regards to how um, much Calvin, I think, influenced, for example, Bart, who is anti-speculative, uh, Schleiermacher, who is anti-speculative. And so this quote on page 97, I really enjoyed where basically uh, Calvin is describing how God um, reveals God's self not as he is in himself, but as he is towards us. And that's a, I saved that quote because it's echoes almost directly something that Schleiermacher makes a case of in his, um, church or in his Christian faith. And, um, so I was looking for connections between Calvin and Schleiermacher, and that's a very direct one. Um, that's almost identical to a point that uh, Schleiermacher makes. And it, and it emphasizes both of their shared non-speculative approaches to theology. I write about that in my Schleiermacher book, where that's a really strong um, motif in Schleiermacher's thought. And it's the main reason why I think that some of the kind of subjectivist um, readings of Schleiermacher miss the mark entirely. Um, another passage I saved on page 108 it's just a classic from Calvin where he says, From this we may gather that man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. That phrase, factory of idols, is just great. It's a very good phrase. Um, I think about that a lot, just how we are prone to creating idols. We are prone to ideology um, or to uh, Id idolatry. Excuse me. Um, and so that was, those are very interesting things. Now there's one I know I said I, I'd be mostly positive here. There's one thing that I um, saved that I, I think it was just an example of um, some of the problems I have with Calvin, and this is within the context of providence. Um, and so Calvin makes this case that some mothers have full and abundant breasts, but others are almost dry, as God wills to feed one more liberally, but another more meagerly. And so obviously he's talking about providence and the fact that some children are hungry and other children are full. And he says that it's God's will to feed some and not feed others. And so obviously that's something that I think must be reacted against and resisted. I, I disagree with that strongly as an interpretation both of God's will but also of um, the political implications of that could be dangerous along the lines of saying that Poverty is God's will for people to teach them a lesson, X, Y, and Z, um, instead of seeing poverty as a negative thing and as something that we as humans can and should work to overcome and sh should work to um, alleviate. Um, and obviously, Calvin will have a place for stressing, like I said, quoted in the other version, that um, you, have to, you have to help the poor. Um, so he doesn't mean that, but I, I just think that reading of Providence is um, problematic. Um, and let's go to another one. There is an interesting case where the, the editors to this volume have a footnote where they describe Calvin's relation to natural theology as being entirely negative, where he doesn't actually have space for natural theology, um, which I think is a very interesting reading. It's not one I've heard. I've heard the interpretation of Calvin having a lot of room for kind of that dualistic knowledge of God, where you have both the natural knowledge of God and then the divine knowledge of God. Um, but they kind of made this argument that Calvin assumes that yes there can't there in theory there could have been a natural knowledge of god but that's only theoretically possible if adam had not fallen when in reality anything we know of god is actually through revelation and so a quote um, from 278 for this is that flesh is not capable of such lofty wisdom as to conceive god and what is god's unless it be illuminated by the spirit of god and so it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's by revelation that God is known and knowable to us. And so um, this seems to be 
I think he flirts with the idea of natural revelation more so than Bart does, but I think there's room to see that there's a little bit more con congruity. There's a little bit more of a link between uh, Bart's rejection of natural theology and Calvin's theology. Um, Calvin, of course, was a big uh, fan of Calvin. Uh, sorry, Bart was, of course, a big fan of Calvin, and so there are definitely a lot of overlap there. Um, moving on into the second volume, we're still in book two, I believe. Um, but this is just a, as an example, union with Christ. Uh, Calvin takes that as um, kind of the central um, aspect of election and how Christ is the mirror of our election. And so he does have a Christocentric doctrine of election. And like I said, it is placed within this context of prayer and in, in the context of um, emphasizing confidence in one's election. It's not the speculative doctrine. I think for me, growing up, election was often portrayed in Calvinism as this very speculative thing um, rooted in a little bit more uh, fantasy than in, in um, you know, actual scripture or in um, the Christian te teachings. And so reading this kind of softened Calvin. I still don't agree with him on election, of course. I, I, um, have my issues with it, but I think, um, or Calvin's exposition of it, but I think I have a little bit more appreciation of what Calvin's trying to do by actually, you know, kind of reading this myself. Um, and so I enjoyed that. And then one final section is the last chapter of the Institutes was really fascinating. It was such a, honestly, it was a wild ride where Calvin does this kind of back and forth dance. And it really confirmed Boyer's reading for me of Calvin, where he, he lets the cat out of a bag with one hand, but he's desperately trying to put the radical cat back into the bag uh, politically, even though he does end with this kind of profound out of nowhere radical claim where we, he, 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 concludes by giving permission to resist unjust rulers, but under the rubric that we have to obey God and not man. And so that's the final criteria for Calvin at the end of um, his chapter on civil government. But it's highly, I, I highly rec recommend it. He goes between this duality of obeying rulers, even if they're unjust, but also the primacy of you have to obey God against the unjust rulers, and then that God may also use revolting servants. I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, on page 5, uh, 1517, Calvin writes, For sometimes he raises up avengers from among his servants and arms them with his command to punish the wicked government and deliver his people oppressed in unjust ways from miserable calamity. And so Calvin kind of creates room for actually seeing the rebellious as servants of God in that regard as people that God raised up in order to overthrow unjust rulers. Um, even while he's having this kind of battle with the texts of scripture and this battle with um, his own political time. Um, but I found that really interesting as a conclusion concluding chapter of Calvin's uh, system. And so I, um, yeah, highly recommend doing something like this for yourself. If you, maybe there were some ideas here that I brought up that were very interesting. Obviously, there's so much in Calvin I didn't cover. These are just kind of the side comments that I picked up on. Um, his exposition of the threefold office of Christ is, of course, notable and something I really appreciate. Um, Christ is both prophet, priest, and king. Um, there's a lot more in his understanding of sacrament that I thought was interesting. Um, I'm not an expert in different sacraments, um, different concept of sacrament, but that was interesting. Um, his understanding of creation, his, his short section on the Trinity was really fascinating, just how short actually it was and kind of a um, minimalist. And, um, so I found that really interesting as well. Um, but there's a lot here. Um, i liked Calvin. I think this is, um, a someone that I want to return to more thoroughly, but hopefully this kind of just reflecting on Calvin and kind of what I learned. Um, I think I'm convinced at the moment by parties interpretation, that the center of Calvin's theology is, um, if not the center, a central element in Calvin's theology is our union with Christ. And I think that paints Calvin in a different light than sometimes he's presented in this kind of cold, sterile, uh, figure who's, um, not quite as uh, devotional, but actually there's quite a lot of devotional qualities to Calvin. Um, and so I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I think Calvin's interesting 
I would recommend um, you check them out if you have an interest in Calvin. Um, I'll link all of these books below um, so that you can read them yourself. Um, I found them quite helpful. There's, of course, endless amount of books on Calvin. I've not yet read Bart's uh, lectures on Calvin, but that will be one of the books I read in the near future and um, and all of that, and I look forward to that. And so, yeah, this is my little overview on Calvin. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert on Calvin. I've only read this somewhat small stack of Calvin, um, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I hope you enjoyed this video. So let me know if you have any questions or any comments below, but thank you so much for watching and have a great day.